So really four things I'm gonna to try to cover right now and I got some detailed slides, but the US is superpower is innovation. We don't do Medicaid well, we don't do socialism well, we try, but our superpower is innovation. There's a reason why that is. To fix healthcare costs, we have to fix food. Food right now is a gateway drug to healthcare costs. The thing that should have been said right at the beginning of COVID is stop eating refined sugar. That would have likely reduced death rate by 40% alone, but the FDA wouldn't do it because they didn't have an RCT. Would have saved lives. Just refined sugar. Innovation is a deflationary force. When we talk about innovation, we talked about TFP yesterday. The objective is innovation is not to come up with a better product that's more expensive. It's to come up with a better product that's cheaper. And the way we're going to do that is digitizing everything. Yes, tech has got a problem right now, but we focus on ag tech. We can drive tremendous productivity, and there's a whole range of things in our economy we can do that. What we do at iSelect is we focus on the fact that 7.8 billion people in the world, and every single one of them has to eat. They don't have to have an iPhone. They have to eat. By 2050, that population will increase by th two to three billion people because people are living longer. That's going to put a worldwide pressure of doubling protein. We don't have enough farmland to make that many pigs and soy. It's an unbelievably large market. In the U.S., we spend 1.7 trillion on food. We spend 1.9 trillion on healthcare. I made my bones at McDonnell Douglas on the F-18 ENF program because I figured out how to save a billion dollars on a multi-billion dollar program and eliminate 10% in the waste of that product. We're talking about an industry in which we spend $1.7 billion to make the product and eat, and we get one point a trillion dollars of healthcare costs. It is ridiculous. When we talk about making better food, we talk about somebody who's in the inner city or at the bottom of the pyramid eating ramen noodles and fried foods every night or crappy food or processed food. And when we talk about how to fix it, it's about how to deliver, for example, plant-based meats at a lower cost so that it's price parity with ramen noodles, not price parity with beef. When we think about figuring out how to fix healthcare, we think about new business models. Who's the only person in the insurance care industry that wants you to live longer? It's not your health insurer. They make more money if they put out $200,000 to deal with your cancer. It's the person who's issuing you life insurance because they want you to live longer. They want to get you into life insurance. They want you to live longer. It's a different business model. Innovation is about a different business model. Innovation is America's superpower. Why is that? Does anybody know why we took out life, liberty, and a state from the Declaration of Independence? why that change was made? Because we understood at the time that property did not matter. Up until that point, Adam Smith said, the economy is a function of manufacturing and resources. You need to control those resources and the means of production. And with that, we can deploy better goods. You need feudal serfs, a factory, machinery, and you need control of the labor. What was recognized by Thomas Jefferson as a result of some of the things he was reading is, is actually the human mind is the greatest productive force we have ever seen. And we're gonna create a country focused on the fact that the human mind with liberty can do that. If you can get this link on an article I wrote on it, it's what Paul Ryan said yesterday. There is no limit to the productive capacity of the human mind. So here's an example, start geeking out. You're not gonna be able to fully understand this slide. That top slide is US GDP over a long period of time. The US, every other country in the world that we're worried about, China, if you remember Japan in the eighties, what we were always worried about is their growing GDP, will they beat us? Here's the fundamental truth about every other country in the world that's ever tried to compete against us. They are always, once they reach nominal stasis, 1% lower in GDP growth per year. Why? They're copycats. They're great process implementers. They copy what we do. The best innovators in the world are product innovators. Rob Ryan is one of the best product innovators for the internet. Who's the best product innovator for food? Who's the best product innovator for, for uh, energy? When Rob Ryan first started selling what he was selling at Ascend, he went out 
to every single ISP starting with A and ending up at PSI Net and got an order to sell his product. He was close to the customer, driving innovation, delivering a product that was incomplete, but he was innovating and trying to figure out what the customer wanted. The reason why the U.S. is better than anybody else in product innovation is because we pay attention to that customer and understand how to innovate it. So no other country can beat us on that as long as we apply our minds. So how do we get GDP faster? If the U.S. is so good at this and we see 2.5% GDP growth, how do we get it better? In the 50s and the 60s, we ran around 4%. The reason we can't do better is twofold. In the early 1900s, we couldn't run corporations well. Alfred Sloan stepped in, set up the modern organization to deal with the confusion of how do you deal with all these customer requirements and move them forward. That's worked for a long time. What do we do next? We have to leverage distributed audit, uh, DAOs. We have to leverage engagement with customers. We have to leverage venture capital, get close to those customers again. What's the other reason we can't do it? Because large corporations like Boeing that I worked for are rent seekers. They have a choice of either driving innovation or calling up their senator and saying, you know what, let's, you know, give me some low cash so I can buy my stock back. Let's set this up so that I don't have to worry about SpaceX. We have to get rid of the rent seeking and we got to get our corporations focused on customers. And people in this room have got to decide what role they're going to play. Are you a person who provides capital? Are you a person that helps a startup? Are you a, someone who helps a startup find customers? Are you a person that tells other people the story? You each play a role. Your success puts you into that area of responsibility. Total factor productivity is a chart I mentioned yesterday. This chart, you can't read it. The top line is exponential growth in tech. Now it's reached its peak. All the other lines is every other industry code in our country that hasn't had increased the total factor productivity. Total factor productivity is basically the consumer welfare that we're delivering to consumers to make their lives easier. It's not about cat gifts. It's about a woman in Ferguson who can't afford to get a good job, who has to drive, take a bus from Ferguson to St. Louis because that's the only public transportation available when her job opportunity is in St. Charles. If she had a low cost autonomous transportation and taking a bus line, her human capacity could be used. The ability to use technology to bring people into the game is what it's about. And every other one of those lines, except the top yellow one, is opportunity for us to grow global economy. Same chart in data, digitize everything. This is a chart of every industry and every sector of that industry and the degree to which it's digitized. Amazon has digitized its model. It reduces the amount of resources it needs because it's using digitization to automate business processes and speed them up. Every red and yellow box in this is an opportunity for investment. We focus on ag tech, we focus on healthcare. Innovation is deflationary. We've got industries here where we've seen constant decline in cost. We're not talking about innovating things that are more expensive, that's stupid. We're talking about how do we get the cost of those things down so that somebody who is at the bottom of the pyramid can eat well and not cause diabetes and bring on those other costs. There's about $6.5 trillion of wealth in the United States. Only $1 trillion is applied to venture capital. Venture capital is the major force that fuels this whole thing. It should be $4 trillion. If we put $4 trillion into venture capital, our GDP would be 4% per year for the rest of our lives. It's the application of that capital in the right way. It doesn't matter that there's a downturn in venture capital right now. There are 50 industry segments that need more of it. Venture capital is consistently the highest performing asset class. It, it's, Ill, it's, it's illiquidity. It's non-correlation. It, you know, let's stop this noise about, you know, we're talking about what's the Fed going to do next week. If we are really trying to drive long-term growth, let's think about long-term and the truth about what drives it. Yale allocates 18% to venture capital. You all probably allocate 2%. What does Yale know that the rest of us don't know? They do something different about venture capital. Yale sees venture capital as optionality. Anybody who's really smart about investing always does. And optionality means, and this is the shift, we're not talking about venture capital in a classical sense. We're talking about venture capital from a standpoint of optionality. You invest early on in opportunities. This is the major thing we changed at Boeing when I worked for the CTO. The CTO, who was the guy when Gemini came in wrong and landed 100 miles off course, he had the project on the weekend to fix it, and he did. 
very smart guy, but he said to me, he said, I can't figure out what to invest each year in. I'm not smart enough to do it. He's CTO of Boeing. He knows a lot of stuff. Where do we spend 2.5 billion per year? And we created a, a program of optionality in which we basically said, let's not rigidly put rules on the early technology. Let's invest in a lot of early technology and let it emerge and reveal itself. Let's get it close to customers. Let's see whether it can evolve the new business model. And then if it takes off two out of 10, then let's apply a huge amount of capital. That's what Yale does that not many people know, understand. And that's why Yale applies 18%. And that's why Yale is the highest performing asset manager out there. We focus on ag tech and healthcare. Venture capital innovation is U.S. superpower. If you ever, if you, if you ever really want to understand what's going on in the world, go follow me on Twitter. Some of the brightest people in the world. Eli's one of them, and he's got a list of what we got to do next. We're focused on ag tech. I want to understand how to bring you guys in to this effort to drive the investment. Whether you come in as an investor, whether you've got conditions to say I'm not going to invest until the following is true whether you have information about the market that can help us do it better or whether you can connect us to people that can do it better. That's our mission is to drive innovation at iSelect. But also what the mission is, there are people focusing on all these other things. If you think about our economy and you drive Rob Ryan-like innovation into these other areas, this whole thing will be solved in a lot better way than going to the government and asking them to try to catch up. So thank you for your time.